right, Slow City Church. Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see you. Happy Sunday. Hopefully you got to say hello to someone around you and meet someone new. Uh, how, how many of you in here are Cal Poly students? <laughs> so good. Uh, how many of you in here are not Cal Poly students? Awesome. It's like half and half. <laughs> so good. Hey, this is uh, such a great Sunday. My name's Tim. I am one of the pastors here. I serve as executive pastor here at Slow City. Uh, Brent will be back next week, so worry not. Uh, he's in real life church in Valencia this week, uh, using his gift to bless that community. And you're stuck with me. So thank you for being here. And uh, we're going to be continuing a series called The Way Back to You. And we're looking at the life of Moses and what this means for our life, to be able to find ourselves and find God amidst all the craziness that life can throw at us. Uh, as I've talked with a few different people, uh, even just this morning, it seems like for a lot of us, this last week was just a little chaotic. Anyone have a chaotic week this week? Uh, there's a th common theme going on, and uh, I hope that this message lands for you amidst the chaos of your week. Uh, I was talking with Brent and even my wife. I'm like, I need help. I feel stuck in prepping this message. And they help you know, me through it along with the Lord helping me through it. But there are moments in life where we feel like that, right? Where it's just like, man, life is piling some things on. And you just feel stuck. You're like, I don't know how to get through this moment. And if you're in that place this morning, can I just encourage you to lean in? This message, I hope, is encouraging to you and reminding us that there is a God who meets us where we're at, who begins to reveal himself and who he is, and then leads us through our stuckness into places of freedom and deliverance, and that he is with us through it. So we're in the life of Moses. We're looking at these moments where we feel stuck in life. I was thinking about this week. I'm like, one of the most stuck times that I have felt that just reminds me in these moments how God is so faithful is when I was 19 years old. I'm 43 now, but when I was 19, I had decided that I was gonna move to Truckee, California, and I was gonna pursue what I loved, which was snowboarding. I'm like, I'm gonna just go to Truckee, I'm gonna do that, and uh, I found myself living in Truckee, snowboarding in Truckee, and I, I got hurt as one does, snowboarding every day, and moved back home, and I remember feeling just completely stuck in life. Like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Where am I gonna find meaning and purpose and fulfillment? I was kind of in that young adulting stage and realizing I needed to figure some things out, and I had no way forward. And I began going to church with one of my friends that I grew up skateboarding with, and, and he became a Christian. I was like, you're a Christian now? That's weird. Uh, but I'll go to your church with you, similar to a slow city church environment, right? And uh, I began serving in uh, middle school Sunday school. I was the Sunday school teacher. I remember Sunday school back in the day. They don't do it anymore as much, right? But, uh, and and I, I taught junior hires for 45 minutes on Sunday mornings for two services. It was, the youth pastor's like, God might be doing something in your life because no one wants to do that. And you seem to really enjoy hanging with middle schoolers for 45 minutes trying to teach them the Bible. And I began to lean into that. And I sensed God leading me through that place of seeming purposelessness and meaninglessness, not sharing where I was gonna find fulfillment in my vocation and a sense of direction in life. And he was faithful to show me through to a place of purpose and meaning. And there may be places in your life this morning that you feel like, man, I feel stuck. I don't know where to go. My hope is that we could open our ears, open our eyes to what God may wanna speak to us this morning as we look at the way back to you. Uh, there's a quote from C.S. Lewis in Mere Christianity. He talks about this way back to who we most truly are. And it's been kind of sticking with me through this series. I wanted to read it for you this morning. It says, your real new self will not come as long as you are looking for it. It will come when you're looking for him. Does that sound strange? The same principle holds, you know, for more everyday matters. Even in social life, you will never make a good impression on other people until you stop thinking about what sort of impression you're making. 
<coughs> even in literature and art, no person who bothers about originality will ever be original. Whereas if you simply just tell the truth, you will, nine times out of 10, become original without ever having noticed. The principle runs through all of life, top to bottom. Give yourself up and you will find your real self. Lose your life and you'll save it. He quotes Jesus there. This is the way of Jesus. This is the way back to you. This series has been one where we've explored this story of Moses just to catch you up a little bit about Moses. It's, it's a pretty familiar story, so it's kind of a dangerous story to teach on because people check out, like, oh yeah, I've heard that a million times. Uh, and can I just encourage you, lean in, use some imagination of considering, God, what might you have to speak and to say through this really familiar, if it is for you, story? We find Moses, and Moses is one of the Israelite babies that was born during a time where the Egyptians had enslaved Israel. They were using the Israelites to build their empire. And they had, the Pharaoh had issued a decree to kill all of the Israelite baby boys to minimize their power as a family and as a culture and a community of people. And Moses was one of those boys that was sent down the Nile and saved by his mom and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter and raised in Pharaoh's court. Moses comes to find out who he is along the way, and Brent's done an incredible job explaining how that connects to our life and how we discover who we are in Christ. And uh, Moses finds himself filled with passion for his people Israel and torn because he was raised in Pharaoh's palace, and he ends up killing one of the Egyptians who was abusing one of the Israelites. And then he, out of shame and fear, flees to Midian in the wilderness, and he finds a new life there. He, he meets a wife that he marries and then starts a family. He finds a job with his father-in-law and begins to keep sheep in the wilderness. And then one day as he's wandering through that wilderness, he meets God through a burning bush, and God says, go and deliver my people out of the hands of their oppressors from the Egyptians. Moses is like, me? I'm just like keeping sheep. He's here wandering in the wilderness. Why me, right? And God begins to have this conversation, meets him where he's at, and sends his brother Aaron to come and help him. And Moses goes to Pharaoh, and he says, Pharaoh, let God's people go, that we may go worship God in the wilderness, and Pharaoh's like, no. And that's where we pick up the story. Pharaoh's heart is hardened from what God would have to speak about his people. And this is a really touchy subject. We, we know this story of the plagues and the Passover likely. Maybe you've seen the Disney movie, you know, of it, Prince of Egypt, right? And, and, and this is like a really sensitive, theologically complex story to wrestle with because it's God sending plagues and creating devastation and chaos for the Egyptians. But it's also God showing himself as a defender, a deliverer of the oppressed, one who brings freedom for captives, liberation for people who find themselves trapped with no way out. So we have to take both of those in tension and consider where we might be at today. And to know that God shows up as a loving father admits both of those things. That sometimes the most loving thing you could do is say, hey son, put that knife down, you're gonna hurt yourself and someone else. And other times, the most loving thing you could do is just grab that knife and say, we're gonna put that over here. Come follow me, I'm gonna show you the way forward, right? That there's many different expressions of love amidst different circumstances that people are gonna to respond to differently. So we need to take this into view as we look at these plagues and how God delivers his people amidst them and how he's proclaiming his goodness, not just to the Israelites and to us, but also to the Egyptians who were their oppressors. So we're gonna look at how God meets us where we are. We're gonna take a little bit of a deep dive here just for a few minutes through the plagues, all right? You may be like, oh wow, I didn't come to church this morning to hear about the plagues. 
it's good. Learning about the Bible is a helpful thing because it helps us, especially in the Old Testament, understand the richness of history that we walk in and admit. That these were meant to point us and point the Israelites and point people throughout history to the God who delivers amidst our stuckness and point us to the ultimate deliverer, the anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, that this was the one that was to come and fulfill these stories once and for all and show us the love of God as a pinpoint in history that we look now back to and that they at this point were looking forward to that there would be a Messiah, there would be one who would deliver them. So Exodus 7, 5 says this, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So the first three plagues are three plagues of creation. See, it happening amidst their, their physical surroundings. They had the Nile River. That was something that they would worship because it brought um, abundance to their land. They were able to farm the land. The Nile would swell and shrink and it would create wonderful farmland for them to exist in it. And God turned that Nile to blood. And then he turns that bloody Nile into a land of frogs, the second plague. Frogs were what one of the many gods that the Egyptians worshiped. They worshiped reptiles. And it was something that they were confused about. But the magicians, it says here in Exodus 8, 18 through 19, it says, but when the magicians tried to produce, oh, sorry, that's the last and final plague. The magicians turned water to blood. The magicians of the Egyptians also produced frogs. But it was the third plague that God began to show that he was the God the creator of the heavens and the earth. And it says in Exodus 8, 18 through 19, but when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. Since the gnats were on people and animals everywhere, the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hard and he would not listen just as the Lord said. So we see this first set of plagues and God beginning to show he's more powerful than even the magic arts of the Egyptians. And then there's three plagues of earthly distinction where God begins to separate, separate out the Egyptians from the Israelites. And these plagues were only affecting the Egyptians. The fourth plague of flies we see in Exodus 8 and then the plague of livestock in Exodus 9 and then the last plague, the plague of the boils in Exodus 9, 11 says the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils that were on them and all of the Egyptians, that there was a distinction made with these plagues that were affecting specifically the people of Egypt, God trying to get their attention, soften their hearts, open their eyes to a different way of seeing God and life. And I think this is really important for us to wrestle with and consider, especially when we go through difficult, chaotic times. Not saying that God brings those about, but that God does show up and use them to shape and form who we're becoming and to help our eyes get lifted up out of the circumstances and sometimes chaos of the week or month or season and begin to lift our eyes up amidst that and say, God, you're the one who wants to capture my heart and to lead me through this, to be with me and lead me through it. The last set of plagues is the three plagues of heavenly power. This is God, God's distinctive power that is shown to be greater than Pharaoh and his magicians. We see in the plague of the hailstorm, plague of locusts and darkness. Exodus 9, 14 through 17 talks about that first place. Where it says, for this time I will send all my plagues on you uh, yourself and on your servants and your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all of the earth. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off of the earth, but I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You're still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. This is like a real hard story to read. Would you agree with me on this? Like God is showing up and he is coming with like some serious discipline. He is trying to work them to a place of repentance through the chaos that surrounded them with the Egyptians. He was destroying 
their livelihood, the structures of their society, and he was beginning to untangle them and, and say, you are worshiping the wrong gods and proclaiming that he, Yahweh, was the one true God. And God had chosen to identify himself with the Israelites through covenant promises, as we see through the stories of the Old Testament, but also, I would say, because they were one of the most oppressed people groups in ancient history and even in modern history. And he begins to identify himself with them because he is their deliverer. So what does this mean for us today? Some of you might be like, this is a great Old Testament story. I believe in Jesus, the God of love in the New Testament, Tim. Let's talk about that and we'll get there. We're gonna talk about how the Passover is fulfilled and Jesus is the Messiah and we're gonna celebrate that and remember that through communion together. But before we get there, I think it is important just to settle into this tension for just another minute or so and then we'll continue to move on. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Rome and to us today and he's describing this theology about who God is and what that means for our lives and how who and what we worship determines how we will live. At the root of everything evil and wicked and sinful within us is at the point of our heart's affection, our place of worship, that what we worship, we become like. And the Apostle Paul was concerned, deeply concerned, the church in Rome because they worshiped many gods. And here's what he wrote in Romans chapter one in his opening lines of one of of his most important theological works. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. And for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. Their thinking became futile, became small, and their foolish hearts were darkened. And although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Apostle Paul deeply concerned at the affections of the heart of the church in Rome, and I would say for us today. We may not have idols made in human, human images, although some may say social media may fit that description quite well. We don't have reptiles and birds that we tend to make idols of anymore, but what are the idols of our day? What do we tend to give our affection, our worship, our adoration, our applause, our energy, our enthusiasm to? And what do we give to God? How do we express that? Because that ultimately will determine the trajectory of who we become. The way back to you is learning how to worship God because that's what we were created for. That is where we find the most meaning and fulfillment. The heart is restless until it is found in God. Yeah, yeah. St. Augustine, that was, you know, second, third century, nearly 2,000 years ago, the same proclamation, right, that we get to remind ourselves of today. The Passover is fulfilled in Jesus as the Messiah. I want us to look at this and consider what that means for our life. See, in the Passover, we see God initiating a divine retribution upon the Egyptians who had built their powerful dynasty on the back of Hebrews while murdering their firstborn sons for years along the way. This is an important thing to remember as we read chapter 12 and see God initiating this retribution upon these people. Galatians 6, 7, this is the Apostle Paul in the New Testament writing to the church in Galatia saying this, don't be misled, don't be deceived. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. You will always reap what you sow. This is a spiritual principle that we need to be aware of, we need to be sensitive to, we need to be able to come to terms with in our lives. That we don't just live our lives in any old way and that it doesn't have an impact upon us or those around us, but it does. 
and that God sees it and wants to show up amidst it and guide us through it. This last plague of the death of the firstborn strongly emphasizes both retribution, justice, and redemption. God is telling both Israel and Egypt the gospel, leaving a shadowy trail to the future fulfillment of this event, how God would one day take on flesh and what would happen in light of that. That this story would be flipped on its head in Jesus, that this purpose would be fulfilled not through the death of babies, but through the death of the only begotten Son of God. That God would take on flesh, become like us, and show up in self-giving love, embody what sacrifice looks like for the sake of one another, and for God to write and etch in history once and for all that God is love, not through a lamb that, whose life had been given and painted over a doorframe, but through the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world and his blood would be shed upon that cross, not just for Israelites to find freedom from slavery, but for all of humanity to find freedom and liberation in his name. This is the good news of the Passover. It was pointing to its fulfillment And its fulfillment is found in Jesus the Messiah. Here's how Peter, John, and Paul talk about this. In 1 John 2, 1 through 2, John writes, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you will not sin. In light of God's love is the most powerful place we can find freedom and liberation. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice, the payment for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. That's good news. First Peter 1, 17 through 20, remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of him during your time here as temporary residents. For you know that God paid a ransom. He paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold and silver, which lose their value. It was was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. And then Ephesians 5, one through two, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We're gonna take some time and remember these truths. See, Jesus saw himself to be the fulfillment of the Passover, which is the feast that was initiated at the last plague, the death of the firstborn. Jesus said, or God said to the Israelites, hey, go slaughter a lamb, paint over your door frame the blood of that lamb, and God will pass over your house. And Jesus, in time of his third year of ministry with his disciples, nearing the end, as he already has entered into Jerusalem, (coughs) he tells his disciples, go and prepare a room. And the purpose of the preparation of that room was to celebrate, to eat the Passover supper together. And here's what we see in Mark 14, Jesus talking about this Passover. And, and we're gonna celebrate communion together. We, we do communion here as open communion. So anyone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, you are welcome to participate with us in communion. We have some ushers that have communion cups, the little communion cups. If you didn't get one on the way, and you can just raise your hand, and they'll come by and pass you one of those. Ushers are coming in. So go ahead and raise it up high so we wanna make sure you get a chance to participate if you'd like to. Uh, and Jesus, here's what he talked about. In Mark 14, he said, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go to prepare the Passover meal for you? So Jesus sent two of them into Jerusalem with these instructions. As you go into the city, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him at the house he enters. Say to the owner, uh, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat Passover, this Passover meal with my disciples? 
and he'll take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up, and that is where you should prepare our meal. So the two disciples went into the city, found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. So to recognize that we're participating in communion in light of this Passover meal that was being fulfilled. And here is what Jesus says, starting in verse 22. It says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread, he blessed it, then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. I tell you the truth, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And they sang a hymn and went to the Mount of Olives. Anyone else need a communion cup before ushers finish up, right? Okay, well, we're gonna partake together. It's a little bit unique uh, this Sunday and do it a little bit differently as we're teaching on Passover. It's like, hey, let's just partake together. So go ahead and open up the little front part of that's going to give you access to the little wafer there, the first piece, and hold it for just a moment. This is Christ's body. This is a symbol of Christ's body given over to death for you. Take and eat. And go ahead and take a moment and peel back that last layer to access the cup. This cup symbolizes Christ's blood as a new covenant, a new promise between God and humanity. The fulfillment of the old covenant now come to pass here at communion, at the Lord's table. And this provides forgiveness of sins and restored friendship with God. Take and drink. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. We remember you. We remember what you've done. Your life, your death, your sacrificial love as atoning sacrifice, a payment for us, not as some created being from the heavenlies, but as the only begotten son, God in flesh for us, proving your love once and for all. Not demanding payment, but offering it on our behalf. You are good. You are loving. You are kind. And we see and we know and we experience this as we remember all that you've done. May it inspire and fill our hearts with love this day. In Christ's name, amen and amen. As we finish up this morning, there's one last point. Because as the Israelites remembered to practice this Passover, something begins to happen. And Pharaoh's heart is finally broken. And the Israelites are delivered out of Egypt. And here's what we read in Exodus 12, 31 through 36. It says, During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up and leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds as you have said and go and bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, We will all die. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added and carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs and wrapped in clothing. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. And the Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and they gave them what they asked for. And so they plundered the Egyptians. The sign of deliverance the Israelites stepped into. God was delivering them out of their oppression, out of of what had come upon their lives, the chaos that ensued because of that, the sorrow, the grief, the pain, the suffering that they had gone on for nearly 400 years. God was bringing them out of, was bringing them through. And the, the entire way that Israel worship was formed by the Passover, it set a liturgy 
for generations upon generations of a people that would remember this God who showed up amidst oppression and brought deliverance. And for you today, you may have come here because a friend invited you. You may have come here because a coworker said, hey, you should come to church with me. You may have come here out of utter desperation of just like, God, do you see me? Do you see what I'm going through? Do you see the hardship that I'm facing? And can I just encourage you today? He does. He sees you. And he doesn't want to leave you there. He wants to bring you through that. He wants to walk with you through it to a place of liberation and freedom. For others of you here, you may be like, I have never even began a relationship with God. And for whatever reason, maybe this morning you realize, man, God loves me. He sees me. He wants to be in relationship with me. He proved it through Jesus. It makes sense. I get it. That's what I want. Well, that invitation is for you to begin that relationship with God through Jesus, through faith in Jesus. For others of you, maybe here, like, my life's good. I live in San Luis Obispo. I live in paradise already, right? My family's happy, healthy, works fine. Life's good. Can I encourage you to consider those whose life might not be good? Consider your life beyond your own. Begin to think about those coworkers, those friends, those classmates, those family members that are going through it right now. And we're gonna lift up a song where we sing about this story and let's sing it for ourselves, a God who delivers us, but let's also remember others and sing it as an intercessory song over them. And I wanna just pray for us as we enter into a time of response. Uh, would you bow your head, close your eyes with me. Maybe you're here and one of those three invitations is for you to open your life to the God who shows up and brings deliverance and you need that today. I just wanna invite you to open your hands and your lap. This isn't for anyone to see. This is just a posture of invitation to God. For others of you here, you may be in a place where you realize that you need to just open your life for the first time to that God that shows up amidst the challenges and trials of life and brings deliverance, brings freedom, brings liberation, brings salvation. And you want to open your life to relationship with that God. Would you open your hands as well and just say, Jesus, I trust you. You see me, you know me, you know what I'm going through, and you love me amidst it. And for others of us, if you want to open your hands on behalf of others and say, God, I know this family member, this friend, this coworker, this classmate, I know that they are going through it right now. Would you stand in the gap for them and just say, Jesus, would you come and show yourself to them that you are the God who walks with them through it and help me to be that same kind of person that shows up with sacrificial, self-giving love for the sake of others. God, you see our hands, you know our hearts. You see the circumstances of our lives and this ancient truth that you are the God who shows up amidst oppression and brings deliverance, who walks with us through impossible situations when we feel stuck and forgotten, that you show up in amazing ways, reminding us and others of who you are. So God, we invite you to come. Come in power, come in love. Come and walk with us through those things that we're facing this day. We ask it in Jesus' name.